Greeting and welcome to the 2024 REL Distinguished Lecture Series organized by Department of Religious Study at the University of West. My name is Miro Sake, Chair of the Department of Religious Study. Today, I am pleased and honored to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Ijlal Hussein Saha. He is the founder and director of the Silk Road Center, an Islamabad-based organization that promote culture, heritage, education, and sustainable development in Pakistan. He also worked as an education expert for the government and international development agencies. He holds a PhD in Asian Studies and a MPhil in Pakistan Linguist from Kwasdi Ajam uh, University. His PhD research focused on the culture and religious significance of the legendary Silk Road. He has taught a premier education institution, including the National University of Science and Technology, Islamabad Model College, and Beacon House. He had a key, he has a key, held a key management role at the Federal Directorate of Education, and he has contributed to five major education projects supported by United States Agency for International Development, USAID in Pakistan. He has published research article on language development and research uh, heritage protection issues in, in Pakistan. His first book on language and society in Gilgit Baltistan, Baltistan uh, in, is in press for publication. The topic of today's lecture is the state of research on the Gilgit Buddhist manuscript. So the Gilgit Buddhist manuscript are a collection of ancient Buddhist texts discovered in Gilgit region of present day Pakistan. These manuscripts dating back to the five, fifth century to seventh century CE provide valuable insight into early Buddhist literature, philosophy, and practices. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Islal Hussein Sa. Thank you so much. Uh, good day to uh, everyone. Professor Miroj Shakya, thank you for your kind introduction. Venerables, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me begin by expressing my gratitude to Professor Miran Shakya, my friend Alex, a special interest group on uh, humanistic Buddhism, Venerable Zhu Cheng, Venerable Yu Deng, Venerable uh, Jue Shi. All of them encouraged me to be, you know, part of uh, this, you know, uh, research effort or this, uh, I, I, sh I should say, educational effort. Thank you so much. Um, it's my privilege to um, uh, share with you the precious cultural heritage of Pakistan. Uh, I'll, I, I'm going to share the screen, my screen now, so that, you know, you can see the presentation I have put up for this. So, um, Professor Shakya, can you can you see the screen? Yes, very clear. Thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, I think most of us we know that Pakistan is a major country of the world. Well, it is the fifth largest country with a population of uh, over 240 million people. It has an important geographic uh, position. You can see uh, from the map, uh, it is uh, located at the intersection of South Asia, Central Asia, and the Middle East, of course. Contrary to what uh, you know, media often portrays, Pakistan is a multicultural, a multilingual and multi-religious country. It's home to over 70 languages. It has biodiversity, of course, um, even a common Pakistani with some exposure or education can speak two to three languages in, in, in everyday life. It is, a, it is a Muslim majority country, yes, but has followers of all, all the major religions, Christians, we have Christians, Hindus, Sikhs, Zoroastrians, we call them Parsis, Baha'is, and the Kalasha community. 
it 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 does have a handful of uh, Buddhists who uh, mostly live in southern uh, part of Pakistan. In in, in the history of Buddhism, uh, Pakistan, together with you know, I'll go back to the first slide. In the history of Buddhism, today's Pakistan. Uh, with along with southeastern Afghanistan, you know, you can see on the map I have circled it, uh, is regarded as the northwestern bastion of Buddhism. This is the area which helped flourish Mahayana tradition of Buddhism and transmitted to Central Asia, China, and beyond. After the Achaemenid Persian conquest in the sixth century BC, the northwestern part of ancient Pakistan came to be known as Gandhara. Today, my topic is to present to you an introduction to a treasure of Buddhist texts discovered from this part of Pakistan, I mean, northern part of Pakistan, about a century ago. As Dr. Shakya mentioned, these texts were uh, written in and around sixth and seventh century they are commonly known as the Gilgit manuscripts or the Gilgit Buddhist manuscripts. So although I'm not an archeologist or a paleographer or an expert of ancient languages, I consider myself a student of culture or at the maximum an advocate of Pakistani culture and heritage. So my presentation is not going to be an expert presentation, but I'm going to give you an introduction to the Gilgit manuscripts uh, found in uh, the Napur village of Northern Pakistan. As, as a native of that region, and as a cultural advocate, I feel privileged to share the immense value of these uh, Buddhist texts with you. My topic uh, today, my talk will be divided into three uh, main topics. Of course, um, first we will discover, we will discuss the discovery timeline. When uh, were these discovered and how, uh, you know, the manuscripts were discovered. And then we'll talk a little bit about the content and collection of uh, the Gilgit manuscripts, where are these um, being preserved, stored? And then we'll move on to uh, research on, on these manuscripts. So moving on, you know, if you look at the story, one fine morning in May of 1931, I think it was May of 1931, a local young boy cattle who was a cattle uh, grazer took his animal to gaze on the hills in Napur village in Gilgit. He saw a piece of timber sticking out on the top of a small stone covered mound. The boy started uncovering the structure. He stopped digging after a while thinking that the structure might be a grave. Next morning, a different group of villagers came and continued digging the mound, the same mound. They pulled out the wooden structure he saw, the wooden beams, and entered through the hole into a hidden chamber. The wooden chamber was filled with votive stupas, relief plaques, and the Buddhist texts. The people took the collection to the wazir of Gilgit who kept them in the office of the Hesildar, uh, the, the district officer. Sir Oral Stein, uh, the famous Hungarian British archeologist, saw you know, uh, those scripts in the Tehsildar's office. Sir Oral Stein was uh, traveling back from a mission in uh, archeological mission in Central Asia. He saw them in the Tehsildar's office and then he was the one Sir Oral Stein was the one who announced the discovery of this great treasure. 
it became a big news worldwide on July 24th, 1931. That's the exact date when the news was published in the Statesman, the famous uh, newspaper. So uh, this was this was the first, you know, discovery in, in 1931 from Napur. Napur basically, uh, Napur locally, we call it Napura as well. Napura in local uh, Shina language of Gilgit. It is home to these manuscripts. The village is situated on the southwestern mountain slopes of today's Gilgit. So I'll I'll just show you a picture from today's Napur. This is this is uh, this is the area today. This is the area where you know these uh, treasures were discovered. It's a, a narrow track from the village leads up to the plateau on the Napur hills. So the, uh, the village was very important even in olden times. In olden times, the plateau was used largely due to its strategic location and height as a guarding post. I'm, I'm using guarding post because, uh, you know, in the end we'll discuss, uh, you know, about, you know, what, actual, what actually it was from where we, uh, you know, discovered these, uh, the place, the site, discovered the manuscripts. It was the, you know, the mounds towards uh, the western edge of the plateau that once, you know, buried the famous Gilgit manuscripts. So uh, there are mounds. I, I, I'll show you some pictures, actual pictures uh, from the first excavation as well. Um, you know, after, after this uh, chance uh, discovery, after this chance discovery in 1931, the first systematic ex excavation of uh, this site, the Napur site, commenced in 1938, seven years after the discovery. In uh, August 1938, Kol Shastri, an archaeologist based in Srinagar, because at that time, Gilgit was part of, uh, you know, was ruled by you know, Maharaja of Kashmir. So um, Kol Shastri, who was based in Srinagar, he arrived in Gilgit to lead the first systematic excavation. He started excavation on the 20th of August, exactly 1938, and continued until the 26th. So Kol Shastri, you can see the picture. This is the actual picture, you know, taken by Kol Shastri, he uh, visited the site and divided uh, the four mounds he saw on the site into A, Mound A, Mound B, Mound C, and Mound D. He started from Mound C. Why? Because this was the same uh, mound which was dug by the locals in 1931. All the four mounds were of similar structure. You can see from uh, the picture. It, it shows you the actual picture Kol Shastri took. Um, he spent, you know, almost all the days digging uh, Mount C. Uh, he and his team, they were digging other mounds as well, but he spent more time digging Mount C. Um, this is the mound he reported that, you know, yielded the Gilgit manuscripts. Other finds from uh, this structure uh, included miniature stupas, clay stupas. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about Mount C. And Mount A, you know, uh, did not contain any um, scripts, but it, uh, you know, it contained ivory, brass, and iron rings and pieces, um, iron rings and iron pieces, and ear pendants gold pieces, pearl, beads, birch bark, amulets, and uh, Mount B also, uh, you know, had, you know, a wooden box, uh, which was, you know, filled with gold pearls and coral beads wrapped in cloth. Mount D, uh, you know, also contained a wooden pot 
containing one gold-plated amulet, ivory rings, ivory pieces, uh, iron pieces, one gold coin, brass and coral beads. And uh, this uh, mound also contained ashes, uh, probably uh, maybe of a, of a Buddhist monk of that time. Um, Kul Shastri reports that he um, um, basically discovered a total of six manuscripts. Four, uh, he says, were complete. Two were in fragments, and he also discovered, you know, fragmented leaves as well of the manuscripts. Um, he also reports that, you know, five manuscripts were written on birch bark, with the exception of one uh, manuscript, which was written on palm. So uh, I would like to now talk a little bit about birch bark. Interestingly, birch bark, you know, uh, it's still in use in parts of Gilgit, Baltistan, you know, the Gilgit area, you know, Baltistan area, it's a huge area. In some parts, in villages, uh, people still use birch bark. Not for writing, of course, you know, not for writing, but uh, this material, since it's durable, it's waterproof, they, uh, the people, you know, use birch bark to wrap butter and, you know, bury it, you know, underwater so that it gets old. Uh, people uh, in Gilgit, Balistan, they, they love old butter, you know, uh, wrapped in the birch bark and, you know, they, 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 you know, bury it and use it, you know, maybe after a year or two years, sometimes maybe in 20 years, 30 years. And in some parts, since it's durable and waterproof, instead of plastic, they use it you know, on the roof, you know, rooftops. So as an organic material, people at that time, you know, in the fifth, sixth, seventh century, they preferred to write the manuscripts on uh, this organic material, birch bark. So co coming back to um, coming back to the Gilgit manuscripts on uh, birch bark, I'll show you, you know, I'll go, sorry, I'm going back again to the, 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 the first, second, third slide. So this, this shows you a timeline, you know, after what happened after 1931, when this chance discovery was made. So after 1931, I talked about, you know, Kol Shastri's excavation, systematic excavation in 1938. But, you know, between 1931 and 1938, we saw, uh, you know, some of uh, the manuscripts maybe uh, being sold in the market. They were found in 1936 uh, in Ujjain. Uh, they, they, they were bought in Kashmir, but, you know, they are now in, you know, Ujjain Museum. So in 1938, um, Kol Shastri excavated the site, but still until 1956, um, it is clear that some parts of uh, these manuscripts were stolen or smuggled uh, from the site and uh, Professor Tucci, he got a fourth small set. Uh, he bought it basically from a man in Rawalpindi. Uh, Professor Tucci uh, had already started, you know, coming to um, this part of the world uh, as as part of his exploration and research on um, on on on, on uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhism. So um, so the discovery after the discovery in 1931. We, you know, uh, see these developments happening uh, with regards to uh, uh, these precious texts. So we have talked a little bit about birch bark. Why, you know, um, uh, these scripts were written uh, on birch bark. Uh, just to show you what birch bark looks like, I have a picture from here, and it's very, very interesting to see that uh, from this part of the world, 
we have not only discovered the Gilgit manuscripts uh, until 1994, the Gilgit manuscripts were uh, considered to be the oldest uh, manuscripts in Sanskrit, but you know, another discovery pushed back this history to the first century BC. So it was the discovery of 150 manuscripts in Gandhari language. So it's a, it's, it's a separate topic, but we can discuss it, you know, some other time, but you know, these birch bark, you know, uh, manuscripts, with this manuscripts discovered in Pakistan, uh, from Gilgit, from Bajor, in Afghanistan, from Bamiyan, in, in China, uh, you know, Tarim Besan in China, in Central Asia, uh, are very, very important, you know, both in Sanskrit and Gandhari language. So, um, yeah, coming back to the Gilgit manuscripts, this is, this is very interesting, you know, Kol Shastri discovered that all the manuscripts were bound under wooden covers with leaves held together by a lace or string through a hole punched in the middle of each leaf. You can see this is this is again an original picture from Kol Shastri at the bottom. You can see, you know, the, the wooden covers. You know, luckily, luckily these were, you know, Gilgit manuscripts were written on leaves rather than on scrolls. That's why, you know, they are, you know, mostly, mostly intact. So you can see the, the punched holes and, uh, you know, the, the wooden covers, the decorated, beautifully painted, you know, wooden covers. So basically Kol Shastri um, reported that three of the four, uh, you know, covers were richly painted. He numbered the complete scripts those complete scripts from one to four, one, two, three, four, and categorize the leaves, you know, the fragmented leaves is um, A, B, C, and D. The manuscripts were written in Sanskrit, of course, uh, uh, in Gupta Brahmi script used uh, uh, under the, the Gupta Empire from 320 to 550 AD. So uh, now a little bit more about, uh, you know, the manuscripts, the complete manuscripts. Uh, according to Kol Shastri manuscript, one had 80 leaves and each leaf was uh, nine into three inches uh, of size. On the inside of the top cover, I'm talking about manuscript one, the top cover painted Nandi Deva, the Patola or the Palola Shahi ruler of Gilgit of their time. The, 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 paint, the paintings also contained uh, the picture of his minister and two ladies in front of them. One of the ladies is Queen Ananga Devi. On the inside of the, I'm talking about manuscript one, on the inside of the bottom cover is the painted Buddha with three of his disciples in a meditative pose. These are uh, his disciples depicted here were Mahakashapa and Modgalyana, uh, Balige, Shesina. Uh, my Sanskrit is not you know, very good, so maybe I'm pronouncing them rightly. So this is briefly about manuscript one. Uh, manuscript two uh, had 100 leaves. The size was almost, you know, you know, ten into three inches uh, each leaf. It contained um, the paintings of Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, Avalokiteshvara with Amitabha and Amitabha in the crown, and the Buddha drawn over his head in the background. King Nandi Deva sitting on his right near the leg. So the, this menu, the, the cover of manuscript two, you know, showed this, depicted this manuscript. Three had uh, 40 leaves according to uh, Kol Shastri and the size of each leaf was uh, uh, 11 into three inches. It also painted Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, Amitabha and the Buddha uh, 
according to Kolshastri, um, uh, this particular manuscript, manuscript number three, was written in uh, Tibetan. Manuscript four had, you know, 30 leaves, according to him, but he did not, you know, uh, mention the size of it. According to him, uh, Kolshastri uh, and other scholars, this manuscript contained Ar Arya Dharma, but I think later it was um, it was uh, you know um, properly identified as um, another uh, sutra, Sarva Dharma uh, Guna Ve Loha. Uh, we are Loha Raja Sutra. It was Sarva, I call it Sarva Dharma Sutra. In 1982, other scholars like Professor Tripathi, he uh, identified it uh, as Sarva Dharma, not the Arya Dharma uh, Sutra. I will talk uh, a little bit about it in uh, in a while. All in all, you know, you know the, the counting, the exact counting of. Uh, how many manuscripts, how many titles it, you know, went on as the, as researchers and scholar, you know, uh, started working on this manuscript. Uh, an important professor who spent years and years, decades uh, working on these manuscripts is Oscar von Hinobar. He, according to him, uh, according to him, there were uh, 50 manuscripts containing 57 titles along with the 17 uh, avadanas so this is the this is the total number uh, according to um, von hinobar is the exact number so moving on so, so yeah i have i have summarized this on this uh, slide you can see 50 texts, according to um, you know Professor Hinobar, 50 texts containing uh, you know 57 uh, titles. So these uh, you know manuscripts contained you know sutras. You can uh, you can see on the slide very very important sutras. Uh, oh well, all the sutras are important, but you know the major discovery uh, I have listed it down. Uh, so, you know you know Lotus Sutra. Sadharma Pundarika Sutra and uh, by Shaya Guru Sutra, you can see you can you, you can see the list. Vajra Chidika Sutra. So yeah, so these this is the list we have on uh, sutras. Uh, together with these uh, sutras, this is also very important. You know, the sutras, the Gilgit manuscripts contained the Rani's, Avadana's, and Vinaya texts in Sanskrit from uh, the Mula Sarvastivada tradition of Buddhism. The Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya has, you know, you know better than I do, has uh, five sections, and Kulavaga is one of the five. So here in um, Gilgit manuscripts, we see. Uh, Kulagawa uh, discovered here uh, uh, among these manuscripts. If we go into the details of Kulavaga, uh, uh, there's a vastus relating to the discipline of monks uh, with, with one chapter uh, on uh, nuns and bhikkhunis. According to Kol Shastri, nine of the 12 chapters of Kulavaga were found partially or fully in the Gilgit manuscripts. This is, this is very important. I have listed names of the chapters or vastus uh, which were discovered uh, from uh, the Napur, from the, the, the Gilgit site. So you can see uh, we, have, we seem to have a full chapter, chapter one. We have, you know, full chapters uh, until, you know, chapter number five. And then uh, found, you know, portions of uh, some Veda uh, chapter as well. And he, uh, Kol Shastri reports that 
Samadha, um, you know, chapter was also found. These last three chapters were also found, but unfortunately lost in, um, you know, in the process. Yeah, moving ahead, you know, uh, we'll, you, we'll talk about, you know, briefly about where are the Gilgit manuscripts right now? So whatever we have discovered, uh, where is it, you know, preserved, stored, where are the collections? So the next slide gives you a picture of where, you know, these uh, manuscripts are stored. So the bulk of it, of course, the bulk of it is in, um, in India. So um, these places of India, like New Delhi National Archives, Bombay, Pune or Pune, Ujjain, Srinagar. Karachi has a, has a rich collection as well. Karachi Museum, which was the National Museum of Pakistan at one point. So it has, you know, a, a rich collection. We have these uh, manuscripts uh, collections in London, in Paris, and in Rome as well. Uh, at all these locations, the manuscripts are in good hands. And uh, there are a number of projects working to digitize these materials and make them available uh, to a large audience. Now, our, our third topic is about research. Uh, it's, of course, Gilgit manuscripts uh, still remains a key area of research for scholars across the world. There are multi-country, multi-institution consortia projects working to decipher, translate, interpret, and preserve these manuscripts as, as cultural assets of the world. There is a growing body of research literature on the project. There is, of course, there are publications, the list of publications, this slide and the next uh, slide shows you, you know, the main titles I have been able to, you know, identify and, you know, browse through so far. This uh, list, you know, gives you a fair idea that the bulk of research is by, uh, international scholars. Unfortunately, there are hardly any um, Pakistani scholars who have you know, carried out significant research on this treasure of Buddhist uh, literature. Um, yeah, so, uh, but there is, there is one exception, of course. There is one exception. I'll talk about it uh, you know, in, in, in a while. You can, in the meantime, you can look at the list. There's one exception in Pakistan, just a recent project. Uh, we'll talk about it in a while. But regarding the first publication, uh, the first publication on uh, the Gilgit manuscripts was basically uh, an announcement made by uh, Sir Oral Stein in October of 1931. After the news, you know, the news published in uh, the statesman, he also uh, wrote a brief article uh, for uh, the Journal uh, of the Royal Asiatic Society. So in that he, I, I, I got, luckily I got a picture of it. This is, this is the announcement he uh, published, Sir Oral Stein published in uh, the Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society in October of nine, uh, 1931. So this um, is the first, you know, publication about uh, uh, the Gilgit manuscripts. And then in 1932, uh, we see an important brief publication from Sylvain Levi. He, he published basically a color form of one of the manuscripts in that year, in 1932. So this was followed by, you know, Professor Dutt, Nali Nakash got four volumes, very precious, four volumes of the manuscripts. He published them between 1939 and 1959. Other scholars followed, you know, by Professor Dutt, 
who translated, you know, edited these manuscripts, published philological analysis of the manuscripts in various languages. Um, they include, the big names include uh, Lokesh Chandra, uh, Edward Conze, of course, uh, Professor uh, Giuseppe Tucci, Raghu Vira, Watanabe Shoko, uh, Nioli, Chopin, you know, Hirofumi Toda, you know, we can see, you, you can, you can, you know, go through, quickly go through the list here I have put up for you. And we have scholars like, um, you know, Hisashi, Matsumura, Christopher Ems, Noriyuki, Kudo. So these are all, you know, scholars who try to edit and, you know, interpret manuscripts. There's, other, there's a list of other scholars whose studies go beyond the literary and grammatical aspects of the Gilgit manuscripts. These studies provide invaluable information about the social fabric and Buddhism as religion practiced in Gilgit as far as Khotan in China and Tarim Basin in China. So this is an area I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in. So prominent scholars in this category uh, include uh, Hisashi Matsumura, Kali Etmar, uh, Yanze, you know, Hartman, Gerard Fussman, Oscar von Hinuber, of course, and Richard Cohen. These are these are some of the the big names, you know, great scholars who are working on different aspects of the manuscripts. You know, the, the research continues. The interest is still growing. Uh, I can quote just a few uh, major studies uh, which appeared in uh, the last two or three years. These include, uh, you know, DCMON's article on the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya, found from Gilgit. Sakone and uh, Santo, they, you know, uh, published a great account on the prevalence of philosophical, um, you know, and epistemological studies in Gilgit area of that time. And, and of course, uh, there, is a, there is a thesis, a PhD thesis, unpublished PhD thesis by Adam Miller. So these are some of, some, some of uh, you know, the latest, um, you know, works, um, research works. Uh, in the interest of time, so we don't have a lot of time, I'll highlight just a few key research studies uh, uh, in, in, for today's talk. I have, you know, listed, of course, first of all, uh, you know, Professor Dutt's uh, four volumes. They are, you know, groundbreaking. They will remain groundbreaking despite some discrepancies reported by later scholars. His research work is still very, very important. This seminal work, you know, not only presents transliteration and interpretation of the manuscripts, but also lays the foundation, basically Professor Dutt laid the foundation and knowledge base for um, uh, research on Gilgit, future research on Gilgit manuscripts. Uh, I have chosen two, two more or a couple more research studies to talk uh, about. One of it is of course, uh, Lotus, Lotus Sutra, Sadharma Pandarika Sutra found from uh, Nepal. Uh, it is an important uh, topic, important theme uh, for scholarly research. In depth research, it's still going on, 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 the, on the Lotus Sutra, on Sadharma Pandarika Sutra. Uh, it began with the Lokesh Chandra in 1959. I think he, he did the first you know, serious study and then it, it goes on and on. Other scholars who contributed to our understanding of uh, the Lotus Sutra include, you know, some of the names I have listed. Kishore, uh, Shoko, Watanabe, Hirofomi Toda, and of course, uh, Professor Hinobar and uh, uh, Nioli. These scholars informed that the Sutra figures prominently among the Gilgit manuscripts, they all agree. Uh, I have just to give you an idea. 
uh, about the importance of Sadharma Pandurika Sutra in Gilgit. I have quoted it from uh, from uh, one of one, Professor Hinober's, you know, articles. How important, you know, sutra. How embedded um, sutras were in um, Gilgit area of the time. You can you can read it. You know, a son of good family must go where the sutra is, even after having dived into pits filled with burning coals, having stepped upon scattered razors. This is a direct translation he did from uh, one, one, one of the Gilgit manuscripts. So in addition to uh, Sadharma Pandarika, there is uh, a growing interest in uh, the Sarva Dharma, you know, Sutra I mentioned. Um, researchers, they, they show us that um, the, 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 this, you know, the study of this uh, Sutra or these manuscripts show that um, how you know religious concepts were flourishing among the followers based on this sutra and other sutra prevalent at uh, that time of uh, you know Gilgit of that time under Palola Shahi rule. As we can see from Hartman uh, Hartman's translation of the sutra, from this is this is the, the translation of sutra uh, from Gilgit manuscripts. It shows the merits of the sutra. The profits and merits of writing even one letter of the sutra will be hundreds and thousands of times greater than earlier merits. So this is about the Sarva Dharma Sutra. Honoring the sutra and Buddhist texts, not only this, but other texts will create a great family atmosphere, bring victory in every fight, and the followers will be reborn in Sukhavati. The heaven. So this, this, these were you know prevailing practices in in, in Gilgit of that time in the Gilgit area of uh, that time. So you can you can read through this you know this extraction this translation from uh, the sutra I have you know extracted it for this presentation. You know you can read it. The Buddha stays. At the Vanavana in Rajagirha, together with 500 monks and 1200 bodhisattvas, beginning with Maitreya, humans and non humans alike honor the Buddha. He enters a certain meditation and the earth shakes, accompanied by various supernatural signs. The four great kings, the Bodhisattva Vajrapani, with a large retinue and the Bodhisattva Viraja arrive and worship the Buddha. Vajrapani requests a teaching of the Sarva Dharma. Avalokiteshvara declares that those who hear his Dharma Parayaya will not descend into hell, but eventually reach Sukhavati and whoever preaches it will equal the Tata Gatha. So, so these are these. Uh, this is the translation, actual translation, from uh, the Sarva Dharma uh, Sutra found from Gilgit. So, moving on, uh, translation of the Buddhist uh, Avadanas and Dharanis, uh, for example, is a, a research interest for many scholars. Uh, one of uh, one of the scholars, uh, Noriyuki Kudo, uh, you know, he did uh, a lot of good work on uh, on on uh, Avadanas and Dharanis, and it shows his work shows that, that you know how prominent. You know, Avadanas and Dharanis were in in the practice of Buddhism in in that area in the Gilgit area. Uh, the manuscripts represent the Buddha. You know, these manuscripts related to you know Avadana and uh, Dharanis. 
They represent the Buddha teaching dharanis such as Jayamati dharani, also Bodhisattva Vajrapani is depicted as you know propagating dharanis and teaching rituals centering on the statues and uh, you know dharanis so um yeah so th th this is another area of research um another area of interest of scholars for scholars around the world to you know um, fully understand dharanis and avadanas from uh, the gilgit uh, treasure uh, so in, in in my you know humble effort and um, you know I, I have been able to develop understanding of these uh, precious manuscripts I am still trying but what I have found uh, that there is much still needs to be done for scholars to contribute to our understanding and value of the Gilgit manuscripts one key uh, research area that needs special focus is the um, Mula Sarvasta Vasta um, Vinaya in Sanskrit found from Gilgit. Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya, you know, uh, we had the first publication of major, major publication was a facsimile edition of these Vinaya texts in 2014. Uh, it was published by uh, the National Archives of India in collaboration with the uh, Ashoka University in Japan. It, it definitely is a valuable contribution to our you know, understanding of uh, the Vinaya texts. But we need a similar effort in Pakistan. So the, we still don't know, uh, you know we, we have some publications on uh, the collections in Pakistan, but you know, um, most of them are, they still need research and publication like, you know, uh, the facsimile edition of the National uh, you know, Archives, you know, the collection uh, at the National Archives. So we need a similar publication. Maybe my understanding is maybe we have more uh, text, Vinaya texts as, uh, you know, collected in uh, Karachi. Uh, so before uh, reaching out to the conclusion, I have been able to uh, draw. So um, I would I would uh, request Dr. Moise. Is Dr. Moise there, um, Professor Shakya? Can we? Yes, sir. I'm available here. So Dr. Moise, I just talked about before I jump into the conclusion. Um, can you talk a little bit about? Uh, uh, your research project on the Gilgit manuscripts on the Nepur uh, excavation. Dr. Moise, I'll introduce him. He is an assistant professor at the Textile Institute of Asian Civilizations at uh, the Qaidi Azam University. He is working after 93, 94 years, he is working on the Gilgit manuscripts. He will be the one the, Pakistan, the first Pakistani scholar who will also uh, excavate the actual site in Nepur. He is also right now he's working on uh, the manuscripts I just mentioned, the, the Karachi collection. So uh, before I jump to my conclusions, my understanding, I would request Dr. Moise to talk a little bit about his research efforts. Doctor? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ijdal Saab. Uh, I, I, because I was having a project on uh, the uh, Naupura Karga site at uh, Gilgit, from where these manuscripts uh, have been found uh, since uh, uh, 1931. Uh, uh, before that, Ijdal Saab has explained uh, in detail about the discovery and uh, uh, wherever they are located, scatteredly now in different parts of the world. Uh, but we have to, um, I am focusing on, because it was part of my project, to understand the collection available at uh, Karachi, uh, means National Museum of Pakistan, Karachi. There is actually uh, the collection of um, Aga Muhammad Ali Shah. Uh, he uh, was uh, 
military officer. Uh, and it is uh, the last collection which was existing, which, which, which was uh, uh, found by Agha Muhammad Ali Shah uh, in the offices or, or in the military or, or, or offices or Dogra offices at uh, Bonji in Gilgit, Baltistan, right after uh, the partition um, or uh, uh, the partition of subcontinent and the, the removal of uh, Dogra officers or the removal of uh, Dogra offices uh, from the uh, Gilgit area. Uh, and from those offices, uh, from Bonji, he found uh, this collection and later he sold uh, to different people. Sometimes it is also known as a Shah collection. Uh, and many people purchased uh, collection. One major part of it was purchased by uh, Tucci. And they, uh, thanks to him that he purchased and he uh, donated because the condition was placed by Agha Muhammad Ali Shah that it should not go to somewhere else. Therefore, he gave it to uh, the National Museum of Pakistan, Karachi. And these records are available on the accession register uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Karachi. You know, the accession register data uh, is helping us to connect many things in uh, happening in 1947 um, uh, at uh, Gilgit area. Uh, but as far as Ujjain collection and other collections uh, which 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 reached out uh, after 1931 are also part of the main collection. Even when I looked at, you know, we did a surface study of the site of Naupura and uh, the, what the Kaul Shastri discusses about three different mounds. But uh, there are, if you you observe uh, the site, there is there are no three different mounds. And th there is one mound if you um, count it, and not not a big mound. There, there is one uh, small mound, and you there are three trenches uh, on that mound, which have been excavated uh, by Kaul Shastri. Uh, beside uh, these three mounds, he did also a small excavation on Hensel Stupa. Uh, but uh, these, uh, this, this site uh, may reveal uh, some antiquities. Uh, yes, there are some photographs, some things, but there are some confusions that uh, uh, the collection uh, which was originally discovered in 1931 was maybe because when it was in 1931 for the first time discovered and announced by Oral Stein, uh, and a part of it reached to Sri Pratap Singh Museum in Srinagar, but the remaining collection was still, uh, uh, you know, the, the Kashmir collection was not the complete set. Uh, a part or a big portion of it was available at Gilgit. Maybe the collection of Kaul Shastri was part of the collection available at Gilgit. And before his arrival, the Ujjain collection, because some people sold it uh, in Kashmir and reached to Ujjain, that collection seems to be part of that also. And again, in uh, after 1947, from the same collection, because offices from Gilgit uh, to, uh, to um, Boji were shifted in 1935, uh, based on uh, the Dogra, uh, uh, and uh, and British agreement on uh, Gilgit, uh, the lease of Gilgit. On uh, when the lease was signed, the offices, the Dogra offices from Gilgit were shifted to Bonji. Maybe the collection also shifted from uh, Gilgit to Bonji. And this collection, uh, uh, you know, the last collection, uh, which is known as Shah collection or Aga Muhammad Ali Shah collection, a part of it reached Tucci, therefore we call it Tucci collection. And then when uh, Tucci donated it to uh, uh, to uh, National Museum of Pakistan, Karachi, then it becomes Karachi collection. This Karachi collection um, uh, is can be classified or it has been only classified by 
uh, Italians into three portions, you know, based on uh, the uh, the text available in it. The major collection is more than 130 pages. It is about the Vinaya text. The, this is completely Vinayas. And then is when you date this Vinaya text, that can be dated to 8th century uh, or 9th century because it is later period. But there are some older also. Uh, one is uh, uh, one is uh, a paper uh, or coated with soil, mm, uh, and another one is on birch bark. These sets actually belong to uh, uh, to uh, Sudharma Pundarika and another uh, sutta, Sudharma Pundarika Sutta and Lotus Sutta. Though these sutras, uh, uh, two complete sutras, have around 25 to 30 folios, uh, but the largest is uh, the Vinaya Sutta. Uh, these early sutras can be dated uh, because both of them, uh, the paleography is same, and it can be dated to 6th or 5th century uh, AD, uh, and the Vinaya are dated to the it can be dated to uh, the most recent phase on the site, means uh, means eighth century or ninth century AD, uh, and it is part of um, the major collection which is available uh, in India, and means Kaushastri's collection, and that collection which were uh, transferred. Uh, from Gilgit to Sri Pratap Singh Museum at Kashmir means that all these collections uh, available scattered around the globe are connected to each other. And if uh, one would be able to bring all together, that will help uh, in understanding uh, the uh, old uh, literature of uh, Buddhism, uh, uh, which has been documented at the site of Gilgit or brought to Gilgit uh, from uh, various areas. But uh, this portion, the, 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 uh, some people were thinking that uh, or based on the paleography that it should be linked to the Bamiyan area. Maybe it can be imported to Gilgit. Uh, and some people also believe that uh, no, it has been reproduced or documented in Gilgit. Uh, whatsoever it is, but it has been found from the side of Napura, uh, and the site is important. Uh, but the excavation of Shastri is still confusing um, uh, because what he explains uh, about the site uh, is is uh, more different. When we visit his trenches, his trenches are available uh, at the site. Uh, and I will do in future some, uh, I will test uh, the, his uh, trenches that uh, how much uh, the trenches he excavated are valuable archaeologically. And we will try some uh, uh, diagnostic um, uh, uh, or we will place some diagnostic trenches on the site to know about the importance or further excavations, which will help us to do uh, more research in future. Uh, thank you so much, Isdal Saab, for giving uh, me mm, time in your presentation to tell what is going on uh, on uh, Gilgit Manuscripts, research on Gilgit Manuscripts in this area. Thank you so much, everyone uh, who is participating here thank or you. listening to this lecture. Dr. Moise, please stay online. So maybe we'll have a you know a, a follow up meeting with uh, Professor Shakya after you know the talk. You know um, uh, my interest in uh, the Napura collections is you know and the, and the site as well. You know Dr. Moise can uh, tell us, can explore, can excavate the site and tell us what actually the site was because some scholars claim it was a stupa. Some scholars say it was a monastery. Some scholars claim it was a library. Uh, some of the scholars say it was just a scriptorium, you know, specially designed place for writing scripts. And as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, Napur is Napura is strategically located. So uh, some uh, scholars say it was uh, lived in tower, a guarding tower of some sort. So um, my hope and my expectation and my anticipation with 
Dr. Uh, Moise's work is that, you know, we'll finally come to know what, you know, the actual site was. This, this is one uh, conclusion I have, you know, listed. So I hope he will, uh, for the first time, publish, you know, the Karachi collections as well, you know, but we need a consolidated research effort. You know, my, the, the other important interest I have in these manuscripts is, you know, can we have a sort of a Sanskrit canon of Buddhism? So from these scripts and from other, you know, research efforts, can we consolidate the effort, the international, the global effort to compile, you know, from these fragmented collections, can we compile a Sanskrit a canon of Buddhism, we have, we do have Chinese, we do have in Pali, we do have in Tibetan, but, you know, we lack a canon in Sanskrit, as I understand, you know, we lack a Sanskrit in Gandhari language, you know, which has been, uh, you know, an official language here for centuries, Gandhari. So maybe uh, with a consolidated international effort, uh, scholars like, you know, uh, Professor Shakya, Dr. Moiz, and, you know, other prominent scholars will be able to compile uh, Sanskrit uh, Buddhist canon. That's uh, my interest. The other interest um, I have, Dr. Moiz briefly mentioned, you know, how um, embedded these scripts were in the Buddhist culture of Gilgit at that time. And we're talking about, you know, uh, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, you know, ninth century just uh, before Islam. So the, 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 the research shows they are, you know, embedded in the Buddhist culture uh, of Gilgit. And, you know, interestingly, many of the donors lists have shown that, you know, the Buddhists living in Gilgit area, they belong to varied, various ethnic backgrounds. There was cultural diversity, you know, some of the scholars including uh, Professor Hinobar, they listed names of scholars and, and found out that there were Iranian names in it. Donors were Iranian, you know, Brzezinski speaking locals and, 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 and the, the area, of course, for sure, was a sort of a bridge between, you know, uh, you know, this part of the world and the ancient China. So I have listed some of uh, the pilgrims and monks and monks who visited who visited the area. So, so these are some of the conclusion, uh, conclusions I have drawn from my basic, you know, uh, understanding or basic work on the Gilgit manuscripts. In terms of future uh, work, I have just highlighted about what we can do uh, with, uh, with the collections here uh, in, uh, in Pakistan and how can, you know, we um, work on an international effort to 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 compile them into uh, uh, a whole canon. So uh, I think uh, uh, we are running out of time. So Professor Shakya, over to you. I would like to thank you and participants and Dr. Muiz again for your patience and for your interest in uh, this cultural heritage, precious cultural heritage. Thank you so much. Uh, a word to Professor Shakya. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sa, for your outstanding and informative lectures and also for providing in-depth details on this precious treasure. You know, the discovery of this uh, Gilgit manuscript has had a significant impact on uh, enhancing our understanding of Buddhism. And your, your, you and your team, team's effort in preserving the Gilgit manuscript and its heritage are commendable, and we greatly appreciate it. So we have a few, uh, few minutes left. Uh, so let's begin our question and answer session. And audience, uh, if you have anything, questions or uh, comments, please submit your question in the chat box. And the first question I will put forward. Um, so these uh, are the excavation sites uh, accessible to foreigners, like if uh, like a devotee from international, if they want to see the exact location, can can we have can we see that? Like, are they accessible to foreigners? 
Yes, uh, I mean, uh, there is no, there is no uh, restriction as such uh, to visit the, the place, uh, Professor Shakya. Uh, yeah, if you have a, a proper visa, uh, a, a visitor, a foreign international visitor, visitor has a proper visa. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, you will be stopped from going there. Dr. Moise, am I right? Yes, sir, you are perfectly right. I think that spot may be a very you know, sacred site. So a lot of people devoted from international, you know, they may want to visit. And uh, so if uh, the Pakistan, government of Pakistan, you know, open like a tourism, for, like a Buddhist, Buddhist pilgrimage, like for Buddhist pilgrimage, it will be nice. You know, we can visit and see the exact site where Buddha, our, all the manuscript discovered. Right? And also, Another question, like, what is the condition of the, the those discovered stupa and Portis stupa? Are they still uh, are they kept in the museum or still in the excavation site? I uh, know they are in the museums, uh, Professor oh, yeah. Shakya. Oh. All all the collections uh, which were found were taken into different museums. I have you know highlighted in my presentation, and Dr. Mees has also mentioned. Oh. They are all in uh, in in uh, these museums. They are safe, and mm. uh, the collections are there. The stupa, the votive stupas, stu and you know other, mm. yeah, other pieces found mm. from uh, this site. So it's like scattered in different museums, right? Not just one museum. Exactly. Not not only not one museum. I I don't think so. Karachi Museum has uh, has those uh, you know other materials. Uh, the, the museum in Karachi has manuscripts. Dr. Moise has uh, given um, details already. So, except for the manuscripts, we don't have any um, other, you know, collections. But other museums in in India, uh, and and you know, other museums have these collections. Yes. Igal sir, uh, the excavation which was carried out in 1938. After excavation, some antiquities and some seals. Uh, were shifted to Peshawar Museum. Uh, we okay. can find it in the reports, but I have never observed or I have never tried yeah. to find them out that where they are located. But on the site, uh, the major, uh, you know, antiquity uh, is uh, the remains available at the top of uh, Karga Buddha. And uh, on the other side of Naupura, uh, Karga Buddha, uh, you may know that uh, after Bamiyan Buddha, it is the largest uh, yes. of the ancient art uh, and is available on the site. Uh, and uh, this sculpture is uh, being surrounded by these artifacts uh, to the limits of uh, to 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 the limits of Karga Valley, where. Uh, a large cave is located uh, where we also found uh, yeah. uh, uh, or some artifacts of archaeological value. Uh, that this whole area is a big complex, a big area, a huge area, uh, which reveals sites but need proper systematic excavation uh, and study uh, to explore more. Thank you. Uh, there's some few questions on the chat box. So I'll read for you. Sure. Uh, is there any time frame that Gilgit manuscript have been composed or developed? Um, yeah, I mean, generally it is agreed that, you know, these manuscripts were compiled from uh, the 6th to, uh, you know, 7th and 8th century. Dr. Moise talked about some of uh, uh, the manuscripts in Karachi were compiled later, maybe in the eighth century. But you know, most for most of the manuscripts, it is uh, agreed that they were compiled in sixth and seventh century AD. Yeah. And the second question: As PhD candidate working on Sanskrit texts, I would like to know if any student are studying Sanskrit at Kwade -e Azam or any other university in Pakistan? Uh, that's a great question. You know, we, um, yeah, unfortunately, Sanskrit studies um, uh, is a neglected field in, in Pakistan, but thanks to um, 
Dr. Moiz and uh, some of his students, they have, you know, you know, this this is the only project I mentioned. Unfortunately, Pakistani scholars, you know, except for my uh, teacher and professor, Dr. Dani, late Professor Ahmed Asandani, we don't have any uh, scholars, other scholars um, uh, in Sanskrit working. You know, we don't have a Sanskrit studies department, but now I, I do hope under Dr. Moise, you know, there will be more interest, growing interest in, um, in, in the language and the, the scripts as well. And another one. Uh, sir, I want to add something with uh, Dr. Isdal. Uh, that Sanskrit, uh, Dani Sub was having, uh, you know, it, it became part of uh, the study studies on archaeology, uh, and for MPhil and PhD research at University of Shower, they have some courses uh, uh, relevant to Sanskrit and Prakrit, Gandhari Prakrit. Uh, Dr. Nasim was teaching there. Uh, and uh, uh, at Qadi Azam University, we are teaching uh, because uh, we are teaching paleography and epigraphy uh, and uh, a little bit uh, as a working uh, language for transliterations and translations or preliminary studies. Uh, we try to study uh, Gandhari Prakrit and uh, uh, Sanskrit, uh, not as a detailed uh, study subject or focus subject, but as a part uh, required for archaeology here, uh, not as a, a proper field of study having uh, um, of uh, uh, students and teachers uh, working on philology, you know, uh, rather it is a part of archaeology. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so last question. Uh, uh, the, uh, I wonder if you might comment on to comment to what extent the manuscript have been digitized overall at high resolution, especially um, Pakistan know, side. Yeah, yeah. Pakistan is just I I should say Pakistan is just beginning, but I did mention uh, you know the volumes published uh, by Ashoka University and the the National Archives of uh, India. So uh, they, those are really, really very good and high resolution. Dr. Moiz, I, I have seen uh, those copies in Dr. Moiz's office. So published from India, and it's a collaboration. So those are really, really excellent quality. And we, we expect the same um, from Dr. Moiz, you know, for, for, for the Pakistan collection. Mm, sir, I uh, will aid to Dr. Islal Saab, uh, because I, I, I'm working on the Karachi collection. Uh, I have tried to get uh, better quality images of uh, Gilgit uh, manuscript, mm, but it was a preliminary documentation still. Uh, I have tried to keep uh, the resolution, the images uh, to the maximum quality, uh, but I'm working on it because the two portions of that collection has already been transliterated uh, by Italians. One part of it was uh, missing, therefore I, nowadays I'm working on transliteration of that portion which is uh, uh, which is Lotus uh, Sutra, it means that, that the Lotus Sutra portion has uh, not been translated, uh, but uh, transliterated uh, or studied. Uh, but the Vinaya uh, and Sudharma Pundarika uh, has already been uh, transliterated and studied. Uh, this is what uh, I'm doing. Uh, this is one part, you know, my research was uh, is uh, focusing on archaeology, not much on philology. Uh, from this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, from this preliminary documentation, I want to go further uh, on uh, microscopic collection of alphabets uh, from Gilgit manuscript I have already started. Uh, and some of my students are working on it, on the documentation of every character which has been produced at Gilgit Manuscript. 
And uh, there are a huge collection of inscriptions scattered in the form of rock art, scattered in the form of museum collections and other things. I want to uh, develop uh, uh, what, what I can say a data set or a database uh, of uh, of many uh, uh, many inscriptions which have been documented and those inscriptions with the help of um, AI uh, artificial intelligence uh, if we give data to the uh, to, to this system it will help us to automatically transliterate or uh, it will help us to translate or understand the manuscript uh, in more easier way. Yes. Uh, therefore, I want to work on that. Uh, it is more. Uh, it is more an objective uh, or archaeological objective and very connected to philology. Um, but let's see what it happens. These are my plans. But I have to. Uh, uh, but I'm now designing a separate uh, uh, project. Uh, for doing uh, this work uh, on one side, uh, uh, but uh, uh, my Gilgit excavation project uh, is, uh, you know, the aim of that project was only to go and study and uh, uh, to have some facsimile edition of this manuscript. These are plans. Thank you so much. Uh, so once again, thank you, Dr. Izlal Hussain Sa and Dr. Mujidin call for an excellent presentation and gratitude to our PhD student Alex Amy for his assistance in connecting with Dr. Sa. And thank you everyone for attending. Have a pleasant night. So let's uh, Dr. Is uh, Alex, can you stay with us? Uh, yes, yeah, I'm sure I'll stay. Yes. Yeah. And Dr. Moise as well, Professor Shah. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay. Yes, sir, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so Bye -bye. much, everyone. Thank you. Thank for you, your Professor. Time.